Good morning, and thank you for joining us for the session, Title IX Approaches 50 Years, Striving for Gender Equity in Intercollegiate Athletics. My name is Amy Wilson, my pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I serve as the Managing Director of Inclusion at the NCAA. I will serve as your moderator for today's session on this very timely and important topic. It is an historic time for gender equity, as work continues on the recommendations from the NCAA External Gender Equity Review, Phase 1 and Phase 2, and as we approach the 50th anniversary of Title IX. June 23, 2022 will mark exactly 50 years since President Nixon signed this significant federal legislation. I'm very glad to have with me today and serving as our panelist members of the NCAA leadership team who lead and facilitate our championships. Join me in welcoming, immediately to my left, Joni Comstock, Senior Vice President of Championships and Senior Woman Administrator, Dan Gavitt, Senior Vice President of Basketball, and Lynn Holtzman, Vice President of Women's Basketball. We do have one empty chair at the end. Um, due to circumstances beyond her control, Felicia Martin is unable to join us today. Felicia serves as the Vice President of the NC Eligibility Center, and since, also since taking on the role of Interim Senior Vice President of Inclusion, Education, and Community Engagement last June, Felicia has been leading the National Office Gender Equity Steering Committee. I serve on the steering committee with my colleagues here, and will share information about the work of this committee on Felicia's behalf today. Before we start, as a reminder, this session is being streamed for virtual NCA convention participants and recorded for on-demand viewing. The recording will be available 48 hours after the conclusion of today's presentation. You can access the recording and the session information in the agenda tab on the digital convention platform. You can also view and participate in convention sessions via the NCA convention app the app version of the digital convention program available in the Apple app and Google Play stores. Please note, this is a new app and is not the NCA apps used previously. So today our session will do the following. We'll do a brief um, uh, review of the external gender equity review for context. The bulk of our time will be spent in dialogue with our senior leaders about progress on recommendations for equity across championships, as well as ongoing work and next steps. And then I will share information about how the NSA National Office and membership will celebrate Title IX's 50th anniversary. And in fact, this convention is our kickoff of that celebration. We will be saving time at the end for question and answer. And to participate in the Q&A for the session, you can scan the QR code on the screen or go to joinqa.com, enter the code 93908 to join this session. To submit a question, click the Ask a Question button. I will note that this information will be posted again during the presentation and particularly at the end um, so that you can engage in question and answer as you would like to. For some context, Following inequities identified by our student athletes at the 2021 Women's Basketball Championship, NCA President Mark Emmert called for an external equity review of NCA championships. The law firm Kaplan, Hecker, and Fink engaged in that work immediately after the March championships last year. We know that phase one of the report, which focused only on men's and women's basketball, was released in August. And more recently, the review of all other championships was released in October 2021. When the phase one report was released, the National Office immediately established a gender equity steering committee. That committee is made up of staff with expertise across the National Office in finance, auditing, governance, equity, legal affairs, communications, et cetera. This group, the steering committee, has been meeting regularly, frequently, um, to work on moving these recommendations forward and to engage with the membership, relevant membership committee, committees. The idea of this committee is to have built-in coordination 
accountability, and communication. And I'll note that that communication and facilitation is especially important when it comes to the work of NCA membership committees guiding the way forward on equity recommendations. Divisions one, two, and three have designated committees to evaluate the recommendations and provide direction and valuable input. It would take me several minutes to list all of the committees that are involved. And I know some of you in this room serve on those committees. Thank you for that service. The NCA governance divisional leadership bodies, women's and men's basketball oversight committees, women's and men's basketball committees, student athlete advisory committees, our four membership DEI committees, championship committees, and the list goes on. An important point is how the role of the national office has been to try to facilitate in any way we can the will of the membership as we move forward. I note that as you continue to want to follow the progress on NCA.org, we have a gender equity review icon that will be regularly updated, is regularly updated to present the progress that is happening. Now let's turn to our panelists for examples and details about the gender equity progress across championships. Dan, I'll start with you. Um, before we look at specific examples that have occurred over the last 10 months, would you please describe the zero-based budgeting analysis and decision-making progress process and how that is leading to positive change? Sure, thanks, Amy. Good morning, everybody. Um, the zero-based budgeting process has been led by Kathleen McNeely, our chief financial officer and her team, um, but has engaged uh, the men's and women's basketball championship staff in the process. It's been very, very detailed. Um, since the recommendations came in early August, the men's and women's basketball staffs compiled about 2,800 budget line items for the Division I men's and women's basketball championships in a spreadsheet uh, with the coordination of the finance team. Um, to give you a sense of the detail of the 2,800 different budget lines, there are 60 different columns in the spreadsheet that categorize these 28 different uh, budget line items to make sure that the detail on this process was, was beyond reproach. Um, there were 65 gap areas that were identified um, that needed further evaluation and decision-making. Um, that all bubbled up to a leadership team that include Kathleen McNeely, Lynn Holtzman, myself, and Amy, in taking a look at those 65 gap areas and how they needed to be considered for being right-sized from an equitable perspective. To date, um, 40 of those 65 have been resolved. Those meetings took place between early November and continue to go on on a weekly basis um, to make those adjustments to the Women's Basketball Championships budget and to right-size some of the equity uh, in comparison with the men's championship budget. So while that process is ongoing, hopefully that gives the membership a sense for the detail, time, and effort that has gone into, um, into that zero-based budgeting exercise. It's been, it's been a really good and productive process, and, and will continue. it will continue beyond this year's championships and this year's budget cycle into the future much of the work, I think, is, is happening right now. Once we get into a more annual process, I think the foundation of that um, exercise will continue to bear good fruit. Thanks, Dan. That's really helpful detail. Um, Lynn, I'll turn to you to give us some specific examples about what is changing um, across our Division I uh, men's and women's basketball championships this year, particularly in areas of student athlete experience. Thank you. Thanks, Amy, and good morning. Um, to take the information that Dan just outlined, kind of the process oriented, and it really, the, I think it begs the question then, what are the results of that? And in the uh, large bucket, and very appropriate, the, appropriately, the lead bucket of student athlete experience, um, for the benefit of everyone, I just want to outline some of those items that um, will be very visible for our student athletes throughout their experience, comparatively to cha uh, championships in the past but also um, those that um, are impactful for their experience and then also translate into just the presentation of the championship itself. The comments I'm gonna share are um, quite frankly, um, they are, although Amy referenced both the men's and women's basketball championships, um, the gaps that had to be overcome were, were uh, for the most part in totality on the women's side, getting them up to 
uh, to address those issues of, of where um, reconciliation, I guess you could say, had to occur. So some, just some examples of that. Um, and out of the zero-based budgeting, what you see on the first bullet is that the men's and women's basketball staffs, they also uh, took the um, initiative to do a literal side-by-side -side comparison of the Division I men's and women's basketball student-athlete experience from the point conference championships have finished and you have teams that are sitting um, in a team room, for example, and waiting to see if they get put into the bracket um, where there may be some media coverage of that and then they get announced really literally what happens from that point from that student-athlete experience. That also provided a means to rectify and address some of those circumstances. This side-by-side um, -side outline of that student-athlete experience from that point in time, their team has announced that they are in the bracket and what happened and whatever happens next then, uh, preparing to get on a charter aircraft or a bus to get to a competition site, all the way through the time, a team hoists the championship trophy at the end of the championship and one team is um, going home having not been able to do that but the other is that experience has been outlined and we've engaged both men's and women's basketball committees together in providing that full visibility of that experience so again it's a very important check in the system um, in addition to the zero-based budgeting as dan outlined so then as we get into where have been there have been some of the areas that that there are changes that will be seen for the 2022 championship for Division I women's basketball. Student athlete lounges is an example. There will be now four student athlete lounges for our, in the four team hotels for our women's basketball student athletes. In the past, there was a singular lounge that was, most, that was often in the competition venue that our student athletes uh, just accessed when they were there for practice or some other media obligations. But now um, in the same manner that those lounges have been available for our men's basketball student athletes, our women's championships student athletes will have that. Similarly, there are family lounges. Um, those are also, there'll be four of those on the women's side for the friends and family of those student athletes in those team hotels to access. The lounges themselves, um, we've also gone into the depth of um, literally demonstrating and itemizing everything in those lounges so that the experience of our student athletes will be the same. And where there may be some considerations because of gender oriented differences, we have engaged our women's basketball student athlete um, group that we work, that we uh, have one from every 32 of the division one conferences to get their input as to what they would like to see as women's basketball student athletes in that case, if there is something in that, um, category, if you will. The awards gift mementos, um, this is something that also was, um, that was noted through some of the coverage last year. And, uh, and although um, there really wasn't that distinct of a difference in the awards and mementos, and because we did that um, very detailed review as well, really the outcome of this is, is to validate and to make sure that they are the same moving forward and literally the, what the awards or the mementos are themselves. Um, previously, there may have been similar values, but as we know, perception is reality. And for our student athletes, if they perceive the value of something being lesser than or different, that then impacts the value they personally feel as well. The um, the presentation of those award gifts mementos also matters. If we personally think about what it means for us to maybe get a very nicely wrapped gift from someone um, versus it just being handed over to us, or sometimes we may think a gift bag doesn't show as much effort. I know some of us may not be great at wrapping, but point being is even the presentation of the gifts when the men's and women's basketball student athletes receive them, how, how they are packaged and how they are branded will be the same for men's and women's basketball starting with this championship. Participation opportunities were also something um, distinctly called out in the gender equity report. Um, the one example that has been addressed for the women's basketball championship is that the division one um, 
Women's Basketball Oversight Committee, the Division One Women's Basketball Committee, and then uh, the council and otherwise. Um, there, there was also then the financial support provided by the board of directors to immediately expand the Division One Women's Basketball Championship bracket to the same number of teams that the men's bracket has. So the equitable team participation opportunities now is available as well. The, with that, I do wanna really point out, and it's very important, um, and this will be a very um, significant communication point as we look at the 2022 championship, is that in order to execute that as our committees wanted to make sure, so immediately our student athletes felt the impact, in order to do that for this 2022 championship, we do have to approach it operationally as a transition year. Meaning this year, those four additional games, the, the first four um, will have to be played on the campus hosted sites of where the Division I Women's Basketball Championship have um, first and second rounds. So out of the top 16 seeds, who have the opportunity to host the first round games, four of those will be designated by the committee to have those four games. The, um, that also has necessitated for this year in order to actually just get everything where it needs to go for those first four games and first round games, um, you know, balls and equipment and the gifts and mementos, all of that, that we've had to move our selection show for the Women's Basketball Championship in working with our broadcast partner ESPN to Sunday evening. We have traditionally the last several year, multiple years have been on Monday, while the men's championship selection show for division one has been on Sunday. Um, but we need the extra 24 hours, frankly, in order to operationalize this this year. That, so therefore, um, after the men's show, which will be at six o'clock, uh, there'll be an hour of reflection on brackets and everything. And then the women's show will be on ESPN at eight o'clock that evening. The, um, I do wanna um, also emphasize, because it's again, I think very important for us to um, be uh, champions of uh, communicators on this and for you to have the, exp the rationale, if you will. Um, we are doing everything we can to ensure that that in-venue experience for those first and second rounds, that first four, all of that is, um, that it does have that championship branded feel. That includes um, increased branding signage and, and otherwise, which I think we're gonna talk about also later in the presentation here, but I specifically wanted to emphasize that as part of the first four and first and second rounds. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk about it more. And then the last um, point around student athlete experience for the women's championship, the game presentation. Um, and what that means is, um, you know, again, comparatively, if you look at the men's basketball championship, um, where could we and where have we enhanced that player experience, the intros that occur as part of, um, as part of the, the game presentation, um, the bells and whistles that come with that, the locker rooms that our women's basketball student athletes use in the venue. We have broken, de stripped down everything that happens on the men's side and um, built it back up, if you will, on the women's side to ensure that there is an equitable presentation of that. Still recognizing that every locker room is different. We walk in, but there is signage, you know, the chairs that we are using, um, the team personalization issues, everything. So um, those are some just, I think, very distinct examples uh, for student athlete experience. And um, several of these areas as well, I know have been also through um, examined with throughout our other championships as well. Uh, but obviously my comments there were very detailed about the division one women's basketball championship. Lynn, thank you so much for those very specific examples. Um, Dan, anything to add about the student athlete experience? And it was pretty thorough. Anything you'd like to add in that area? Yeah, I mean, I think mm -hmm. that, you know, I think the other mm -hmm. example of, of the embracing some of the Kaplan recommendations is the collaborative effort that the committees and staff have undertaken um, in this zero based budgeting process, but also just the implementation and the changes that Lynn noted. Um, one of the recommendations was for the committees, for example, to collaborate more. They've been meeting on a monthly basis, the championship committees and the oversight committees. 
and even an ongoing basis, they'll meet on a, on a quarterly once we get beyond this year's championships. And then the coordination and collaboration of the staffs for men's and women's basketball have, have led to, I think, some really positive outcomes, as, as Lynn has detailed. Thanks, Dan. So, Joni, I'll turn to you and, and your leadership of all other championships, which is quite, quite a high number there. And so how is equity being addressed and enhanced for student-athletes across our NCAA championships more broadly? Thanks. Yeah, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. And, Amy, uh, thanks for, for leading us in the process. So um, just to go back uh, a little bit, as, uh, as was noted, of course, uh, when, when the issues and questions started with um, men's women's basketball, you know, we really knew, of course, that we needed to take a look at all of the championships to ensure the student athlete experience. Uh, Mark had indicated that we would have the external review, which of course we have done that. But in the interim, um, we talked as, as staff and we said, you know, there's really no reason to wait if we can do some things right now to make a positive impact. And again, we had the support from all three divisions, uh, from the Board of Governors and from Mark, to go ahead. And if we've found things, there's no reason to wait on fairness. Let's, let's proceed. So while it was not um, an exact science, if you will, with, with the audit that we did, um, when, when things first occurred in March, we put together a, a fairly simple checklist, if you will, using the OCR um, uh, laundry list um, that, that's provided um, from OCR. And, and we ask our staff um, with, that would, for example, Division Three tennis, um, women's tennis, to meet with the Division Three men's tennis. We ask that, that the staff, those staff groups meet and talk about those championships and also to engage with each of the sport committees to do the same and make some comparisons based on those broad areas so that we could pick up, um, again, major things that we may have missed or that we just weren't doing very well at the time. Um, as was borne out in the, in the Kaplan report and then also what we found is most of the larger issues uh, were, were residing with Division I. And so, um, as Amy said, um, I'm a little bit different situation than Dan and Lynn. I, my comments are probably going to be somewhat broad because um, I don't want to keep you here all day as I go through each of the 84 championships. Um, so, it, it, as we went through and we made the comparisons, as I said, m many, of, many things were, were Division I-centric, uh, but certainly not exclusively. Um, as we found, um, again, many of those things, we, we tried to go through and, and improve small things, uh, may, maybe they were format things or, or facility issues around um, at the actual championships. But by and large, what, what we found is it was um, external operations areas that, that we really managed within the national office. And so it made it a bit easier, again, communicating and collaborating with the sport committees for us to make some of the adjustments right away that would uh, provide more favorably to all of the championships. So some of the things that we did was um, both immediate and we've continued to, to do that is to make some staffing adjustments and assignments. We certainly didn't, we're like everybody, we've lost a number of staff members and so we've had to be really efficient in everything that we, we've done. But as we've made those reassignments, we've, we've been certain that we're providing equitably between the championships with staffing assignments in social digital, ticketing, marketing, um, those sorts of areas, even on-site staff, um, to support um, our championship manager who would be the running the event itself. And the other thing that we've done recently with our championship staff is that we've, we've reorganized a bit and we have put um, together a, what we're calling a sport leader for each of the 23 sports. And so we're hoping that that does two things, that we can develop expertise and really greater support for, for example, volleyball but that that sport leader would have expertise, provide leadership, and that we're sharing best practicing practices and making those comparisons uh, between the genders to, again, to ensure that the championships, that, that things are operating fairly, equitably, and in the best possible way for the, for the student athletes. Um, like Dan and Lynn, we found, we found issues um, around some of the equipment and some of the gifts from our suppliers. And so, for example, um, we, we went to Rawlings and we said, could we have just a bit of help? Um, they were providing uh, a few more uh, baseballs than softballs for pr uh, practice or for competition. 
we had small gifts that the that the baseball committee uh, at the division one level was re was receiving, and we asked, could you help us out and provide similar sorts of things um, for softball? Yes, of course, no problem. Uh, we've also uh, made sure that we're we've managed uh, our marketing budgets a bit better, ensure that the the photography coverage at each of the championship final sites. Uh, is the way it should be. And while we're not doing a lot of printed game programs anymore, those that we are doing are now equitable between, um, between men and women. Uh, the, other, the other area with you know, what we're calling external operations is uh, we also made sure that we had equal number of female and male participants re receiving the championship locker room program. And for those of you, it's the celebratory um, apparel that you see at, at, after the championship that the student athletes um, enjoy. Um, finally, um, just in terms of format and, and some of the other things that we've done a bit later, um, we've worked with COC, the Division I Competition Oversight Committee, and we've now provided a day off for Division I softball, volleyball, and women's gymnastics to ensure that they have um, more prep time and rest time and that it's more similar to, their, to the male um, counterpart uh, championship. We've also increased the Division I uh, women's golf regionals from four to six. That allowed us and gave us some additional spots, and we took advantage of that, and so we've added uh, 12 more student athletes, uh, female student athletes, to the Division I uh, golf championship. Uh, then we recently completed uh, an audit of officiating fees, and we found that um, we, we had some discrepancies and we found that in seven championships, it was actually five women's and two of the men's championships. So, and that was across um, all three divisions. So we've made those adjustments. And, and um, again, um, we think that we're, we're putting ourselves in, in a, a little bit better situation. Um, we've expanded the brackets, um, again, for uh, the National Collegiate, uh, the Beach Volleyball Championship, and women's ice hockey. Um, the, the beach is particularly um, in response to growing sponsorship. Uh, in that championship and in that sport. It's, uh, it's very popular. We're very pleased with where that's going. And so in short order here, we've um, increased uh, the bracket and we've gone from eight to 16. Uh, a little bit like Lynn, with some of the elements of it, we're, we're in transition. And so we did not want to wait. We will be having, um, we will be moving this year from eight to 16. Uh, and we will take that championship to Gulf Shores where we've had just the, the eight teams. It's going to be a little bit compressed in terms of uh, time, et cetera, uh, but we, for this year, we'll have all 16 teams at one site at Gulf Shores, and then next year it'll give the Beach Volleyball Committee a bit more time to figure out the best format uh, and how they want to set up that competition uh, long term. Uh, and then the other one was women's ice hockey, and that was really making a closer comparison and, and uh, look between uh, the men's and the women's championships, and, and we felt that that, uh, that adjustment should, should be made. Uh, just uh, two days ago, the Division I uh, Competition Oversight Committee also uh, met, and we thought they were going to um, take a, a bit more time, actually, and think about squad sizes. They also are very um, interested in doing what is right and getting on with it. So they, they have gone forward, and, and uh, the Division I Finance Committee will be hearing not just a recommendation in the spring, but immediately. And they are proposing that um, in women's ice hockey, three are added to squad size, two in softball, one in volleyball, and two in beach volleyball. So um, hopefully and, and uh, the finance committee will be able to meet and act on those and that we can, we can get that done this year. Uh, we also, I just wanted to, to note that we, we tried, uh, we had a trial year of unlimited uh, bench sizes for our fall championships, that was men and women, and, and um, that went very well so that in winter, spring, we'll also be doing the same thing. I mention that because I really do think that that's, it's more impactful, uh, again, for our female student athletes in some cases to, to be included uh, and to be a part of those championship experiences and, quite frankly, not, not be left at home. Um, and then finally, um, we, we're, we're working on the details of really what that process will be long term. Um, to really consider all the proposals, et cetera, and, and have that criteria set so that um, long-term we can ensure that we're not back in the situation um, talking about this again. Thanks, Amy. Yeah, thank you, Joni. Um, Dan and Lynn, I'll turn back to you and move to areas of, of broadcast, our corporate championship sponsorship, marketing, and branding, and invite you to share some of the progress happening in those areas. Thank you. Sure. Um, so specifically, 
around the, again, Division I Women's Basketball Championship. Um, as, I, as I noted, and I think everyone's aware, um, ESPN is our broadcast partner and continues to be so through the, um, their agreement runs through 2024. But I wanted to note this as part of just uh, sharing the information is that as we continue to work with the broadcast partner, last year with the Division I Women's Basketball Championship was actually the first year of the championship that all 63 games at the time were nationally broadcasted. And that um, we actually were in position to do that in working with ESPN the year prior to, but as we know, the championship was canceled, so we weren't able to execute that. But um, last year we saw that occur. That meant we moved away from regionalization. Um, and as a fan, if you're, or, or as a TV viewer, if you're watching it, that meant that because of, um, it, based on where you lived, that would have been what game you would have seen. And moving to national, all the games being nationally broadcasted literally meant that you could change the channel through the ESPN family of networks and see the, see the games that were being played live. ESPN also, um, because of the grouping of companies that they're with under Disney, um, we also had six games that were broadcasted on ABC last year for the championship. And that was the first time that the, a women's basketball championship game had been on a national broadcast network um, since 1995, I believe it was, when the women's basketball, the championship was on CBS. So we had been making, we have been obviously making a lot of advancements. That is also a result of the increased audience numbers, viewership numbers across different platforms that we have seen um, over the course of the last uh, several years for the women's basketball championship. So therefore that um, entices the broadcast partner and otherwise so that um, you get then you get more exposure opportunity. As we look forward to this year's championship, again, there's been really healthy and great discussions with ESPN. We, it is, it, there is the commitment again that all games will be broadcasted, including the first four by ESPN. And, and as they've engaged with the committee, it is anticipated that there will also be some games on ABC again this year. The um, marketing branding signage aspect, um, I'll point out a few things. And, I, and of course, I think Dan may, may very well want to add some things to this slide context wise. Um, one of the notable things that had been raised over the years, and then it, it was very um, notably raised again this past year was women's basketball and the use of the March Madness mark. That has, um, that was announced several months ago, and that is actually fully in play and fully in play to the degree, and we'll show this on a slide here in just a second, that after the first of the year, um, all the NCA social media accounts, for example, have transitioned over. Um, you will see um, appropriately and through a brand strategy, the March Madness mark being used throughout the Women's Basketball Championship this year, including those first four and first and second round sites where I talked about how, since we are at campus sites, the need for very intentional enhanced branding and signage to create that championship atmosphere on the, in those campus venues. Um, the secondary mark, Women's Basketball, we had been, we had been using that was um, launched several years ago, um, a, uh, several different um, phrases, if you will. And the one that we've retained as a secondary mark for our championship is for it all. Similarly, the men then have a unique um, secondary logo, if you will, that they will use. But March Madness is a shared um, college basketball, men's and women's um, mark now being used. There are some distinctions, and I'll show this on a slide just a, a second. The... Um, Cross-promotion of men's and women's basketball championships was also noted in the report. And as membership, if you've been, if you receive uh, ticket um, offers and this started happening this past fall, um, it is now, um, there is information that if you're getting a men's basketball championship ticket offer about when and that a women's offer is coming soon or where you go to uh, purchase women's basketball championship tickets and vice versa. And then another specific example of cross promotion and marketing is that for our for both the men's and women's championships now with our marketing staff there is a um, marketing 
effort around game for anything. And that's generally in the community or the locale where we have our championships. And there's various plays off of this phrase that are being used in the marketing campaign to activate within the community. But that is a shared effort this year in Minneapolis and New Orleans for the women's and men's final fours respectfully. Um, the branding and signage at all rounds, I've emphasized, we've already talked about arena, locker rooms, that carries through throughout the entire championship, um, the regional and the women's final four sites, and throughout the women's final four city. That was also noted in the report and um, was, an ex was a, something that definitely needed to be enhanced um, so that um, when a visitor or someone in the community that it is just known that you are in the city that whether the women's final four is being conducted. Um, so the enhancement of that um, is something that will be executed at this year. And then the last bullet here, gender references around the championship um, marks and logos. Um, that with as a result of our, our DE&I committees, and Amy could certainly speak more to this, but one of the initiatives um, that they put forward was an, was, were inclusive language guidelines. And part of that was, um, was about how in our championship logos that there may have been in some cases a gender reference and in others a not, for example. So, for, um, so the review and um, following up on that across our championships, you now will see gender references being appropriately used and we have guidelines around that that we will be following. And so if we move uh, two slides up, I think it is real quick. Um, you see here on the left, that was um, through the change in the Twitter handle as an example. And men similarly were the use of March Madness now in the women's basketball Twitter handle. And that March Madness does not have a gender reference in itself. That is um, across the men's and women's basketball. But you'll see on the handles where, and men have a similar um, address scheme um, so it was, it's a very thoughtful, strategic approach where the, um, the W or the M is being used associated with it. Um, increased coverage of, um, through those social media handles around the women's championship. And there's in the middle, the example of the bracket expansion to go to the 68 teams. And then the gender references, you see the logos for the men's and women's final fours, um, where the men's logo now includes uh, the word men's within that. And um, even the logo reveals that we did for the 23 championships, final fours do have those gender references now. And as I said, that's a, an across championship initiative in response to the inclusive language. The, um, if we go back one slide real quick, the um, broadcast corporate sponsorship branding, um, Dan, do you want to talk about this so I stop talking? Sure. <laughs> okay. Well, let me go back for a moment just to uh, talk a little about ESPN and our broadcast partners as well. You know, ESPN has been a va very valued uh, partner for NCAA championships, most Division I NCAA championships for uh, uh, some time now and have really embraced uh, working with the committees and staff on, on enhancements uh, of coverage. And in addition to the great viewership we've seen for the women's final four in particular, we've had incredible viewership of other NCAA women's championships in the last year, softball notably, women's volleyball as well. Um, and they've been great partners, as Joni mentioned, when we've added additional days of rest in between rounds of championships. That's increased production costs and some complexity for ESPN. And they've been very great partners in, in embracing that and understanding why that's going to make for a better championship experience for student athletes. And, and ultimately for the determination of national champions. Um, they additionally uh, were interested in uh, rights that they didn't have previously, that we've worked out an amendment to our agreement that includes now women's field hockey, um, women's ice hockey, and regional rounds of cross country as well. So they've been really, really good partners. You know, it's been noted that, uh, that by the Kaplan report and the Dessa report that those rights are undervalued. That's probably true. That, that rights agreement goes back uh, a decade now. Um, as Lynn noted, that agreement goes through uh, the mid-year of 24. So we're preparing uh, for that rights negotiation in the future. Um, but ESPN has been a fantastic partner. In women's basketball, of course, their coverage of the game throughout the year regular season, conference championships, leads to incredible promotion for the NCAA championship. And we're excited about some of the enhancements and improvements um, 
ESPN has gone above and beyond their contractual obligations, as Lynn noted, with the Women's Basketball Championship and other championships, including earlier rounds of the Volleyball Championship um, that were not previously available for uh, streaming nationally. And so we're, we're really appreciative of ESPN's coverage of our championships and, um, and their commitment to, to making a more equitable uh, promotional and marketing and experience for student athletes. Um, similarly, we've seen great engagement from our corporate partners and champions. Um, their, their interest in, in doing more and engaging more with championships, women's championships in particular, uh, since last March has been very notable. Uh, we've had uh, a, what we call a familiarization tour that has taken place for the men's basketball championship for some time. Uh, we uh, introduced that with our corporate partners and champions in the fall in Minneapolis. The, the turnout from our CCPs, as we call them, was, was great, not just in numbers, but in the, the levels of executives that were in attendance. Um, so we're hopeful to see more activations in that area going forward as well. Um, and then as Lynn noted, some of the changes around branding, you know, with Dr. Emmert's support, even before the Kaplan report came out, knowing that March Madness, for example, and other ways of marketing and promoting championships is going to be an important part of future consideration, we hired a firm to, to help us in that branding area and got ahead of some of that consideration so that we were able to incorporate and, act, and activate uh, things like the Women's Final Four, Social Handle, um, Women's March Madness um, in, in, in being part of the, the experience for 22. Had we waited, probably wouldn't have been able to get some of those things done in time for this March. Um, so I think another example of how we've tried to think even in advance, as Joni and her staff have, uh, about making changes before the report even came out. Thanks, Dan. Lynn, would you like to share about open practice and then also a few changes across Division Three? Thanks. Yeah, um, one of the things just uh, playing off of the activations of our corporate partners and champions is that that also um, you know, looking at what we call reference our ancillary events and that those events often provide the opportunity for our CCPs then to activate and to help support those. Um, on the women's basketball championship side, when we, several years ago, um, the final four, the dates changed um, going to a Friday, Sunday semifinal championship format. Um, there, there had been some cursory efforts around an open public practice. And when the dates changed, that was on Thursday. And frankly, over time, um, given the middle of the week and everything, there are a variety of factors that you just didn't see the um, turnout that was needed. So all that being said, and then comparably on the men's side with the Final Four, they have what's called Reese's Final Four Friday, of which it's an open practice. Um, our CCPs, there's some activation support, as I said. So for the 2022 championship, we are instituting, uh, and, and as an example here of, and we have other new initiatives and enhanced initiatives, but a new one that is a um, open practice, and this will be with the two teams that are remaining, um, that will be in the Target Center in Minneapolis um, during the day. Um, there is a lot of effort being made to market within the community to get the turnout. And we, we have seen, and this has been a play also, of course, for our CCPs to have that level of engagement. So that's a distinct example. I point it out often in these um, settings because it also is something that, you know, changes um, what may be a more familiar schedule for some of our repeat teams, but it's really something that is a great way for those in the public to access um, engaging with the championship um, because frankly, we, we sell out and we have been selling out and this is a way for others in the community to come in and be part of a exciting day. Saturday for the women's final four is, we call it Super Saturday. We have our tourney town. We have now this midday, there is a sp concert that's sponsored by AT&T. So it's an entire day of festivities that we're trying to build with our CCPs um, to really help contribute to this um, celebration of women's basketball that happens at the women's final four. Then quickly, Division Three. Uh, we focus so much on Division One here. Um, generally speaking, for men's and women's basketball, there were there were not as many um, pointed out or noted items, and with the Kaplan report, nor um, in a lot of the follow up. But some of the areas that were identified, just to quickly point out. Um, 
Division three women's basketball, the championship game was one, the only basketball championship game across the six, two genders, each of the three divisions that was not broadcasted, it was streamed. And we had already been positioning ourselves to um, address that in 2023 when we have a joint championship, meaning all three division championship games in Dallas, but we were able to move that up and so that this year, the division three women's basketball championship game will in fact be on a CBS affiliated network. Um, and they're also an example, a quick example of cross promotion marketing opportunities we are leveraging is that the division three championship is in Pittsburgh this year for women. Um, Please go if you're in the area, both men's and women's division three, they have not had championships for two years. So please support. But at the same time, the division one men's first and second rounds are there. So this is a cross promotion opportunity that was noted, whether it's um, ticket packages, in venue promotion to go to the other events. Um, so that's, I think a very important example of where we can see some synergies that we, um, that we really need to take advantage of. Lynn, Dan, thank you. Um, Joni, I'll turn to you to make a few comments about um, gender equity work being considered in terms of broadcast opportunities and branding. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Amy. Um, so I, I just want to piggyback, uh, not certainly to duplicate what Dan said, but uh, I think he made, makes a great point that we really have gone uh, to ESPN, asked for some additional help, and they've, they've been extraordinary. And um, so we, we've seen increased coverage. I think that we'll see more offers in collaboration with them. And so um, we, we're going to begin to really do um, a comprehensive review first of exactly where we are with our, with our coverage, linear streaming, make sure that um, that is all exactly where we want it to be. Um, and particularly, again, as it, as it relates to, to that coverage and scheduling of when uh, championships are played and broadcast. Um, I, I also want to just note very quickly, as we're, we're talking about the, the broadcast piece, that we've seen really, really strong um, broadcast ratings uh, and improvements over the last few years in softball, women's gymnastics, volleyball. Um, beach has become more and more popular. Uh, just recently, ESPN um, has, they, they were happy with um, fall with, with uh, women's soccer. And we're talking with them right now. They've come to us and said, hey, let's, let's talk a little bit more about um, women's lacrosse. So a lot of activity in those areas. And I, I want to just also note one other group that um, I think, I, I don't know, maybe Dan and Lynn mentioned, but um, have, the, the coaches associations have been very effective with us and very helpful. And, um, you know, really kind of keeping us to, to be, um, you know, keeping us honest there a little bit um, from time to time was like, hey, you know, we, we need to make sure that we're doing the right things here, pushing us a little bit. And so this has been an effort, um, not only with the, with the sport committees and the staff, but um, I just want to note that the coaches associations are really important. And they've been, again, particularly helpful as we've needed to make potentially some adjustments and think about how we can change some things so that uh, the broadcast coverage, um, et cetera, is, is really where um, we want it to be. Um, I'll, I'll just note quickly that uh, because r really the same things are going on with us with um, the handles, the social media, hashtags, um, the championship monikers, all of those those things, we're, um, we're we think that we're in pretty good shape with those, but we're going to continue to review. And as we um, get into really more detail of um, each of the, like looking at the criteria, et cetera, as it relates to the Kaplan um, recommendations, um, we're going to be certain that we're, that we're where we want to be um, for sure by uh, the 22-23 championships. So I'll leave it at that. Yeah, thank you, Joni. Um, as our next area of focus, let's turn to um, organizational structure and culture. So more of a, a look in. And Dan, thank you for starting us off today with that foundational information about zero-based budgeting, which has been so essential to the, the progress that is being made. Um, I'll invite you to start with this one, to talk about other efforts internally that are more national office responsibilities to ensure we're on a positive path forward. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Amy. In addition to the collaborative effort that I mentioned earlier, that the committees have undertaken. Um, with Dr. Ember's support, we've also enhanced the staff for the Women's Basketball Championships. Um, just recently, and Lynn can speak about this a little more, uh, three new full-time positions were added to the Women's Basketball staff, which brings that staff up to 10, matching on a one-for-one -one basis uh, with the Men's Basketball Championship staff. 
Um, so that, that'll go a long way, obviously, to helping with the good work that's going on for the women's basketball championships. And, you know, I, I really want to note uh, on the basketball side, the leadership of Tom Burnett on men's basketball committee, Nina King and women's basketball committee, and their colleagues who have very much embraced working more closely together, as I mentioned, you know, meeting on a monthly basis um, to compare notes and make sure that there's good alignment for planning and execution on the men's and women's basketball championships. And the same is true of the oversight committees under the leadership of, of Lisa Campos for the women's basketball oversight committee and Judy McLeod in the men's basketball oversight committee. Um, I think that there's a culture that's being you know, developed and built there that I think will be you know, sustaining long-term. Um, Lynn also know that's happening at every level, as Joni has as well, at all the all division two and three championships committees are undergoing the same kind of collaborative effort, uh, meeting on a more regular basis in a, in a, in a cadence that, that um, will, I think, produce really positive results going forward as well. Thanks, Dan. Lynn, I'll invite you to, to add some more detail around staffing and other areas. Thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. I said I'll invite you to add some more comments about the internal progress, particularly staffing. I know it's been exciting to welcome new, new teammates to the women's basketball team. Yeah, definitely. Um, and we were able to uh, quickly mobilize that um, to make sure that we have the resources needed. The other um, extension of that besides um, NCA staff is also the, um, the, the other support that you, we need around a championship and a championship that has grown to the level that it is. And that includes, um, I'll refer to it as outside contractor support, but it's expertise in a certain field such as safety and security um, as they work with local authorities and otherwise when you talk about um, ensuring that all the participants and fans are safe and, and whether it's in venue, outside, whatever the case is. So that is now part of the women's basketball broader staffing efforts as well as um, as we continue to have um, more fans and um, that causes more hotel rooms and everything like that at, at all of our, at our earlier rounds as well. Also services of, for example, um, a travel support that our expertise in that area to make sure that we are um, negotiating hotel rates and otherwise. Within the office, um, I think it's a, it's a case across the board is that similarly, I think that, that has happened on campuses when these types of issues come up is that everyone should pause and take a look at what they're doing. And that's also been the case throughout our office with the other staffs, whether it's um, increased support from our social media team, um, it's increased support from our public and media relations and just how they how these groups structure themselves in order to support then where we are now and now in 2022 with our championships and the visibility and the scrutiny that comes with that appropriately so. Um, Joni noted for the other championships, uh, the review that took place around officiating fees, um, women's basketball, men's women's basketball were also part of that review. And there was a gap for our championship game official fees for the division one only um, women's basketball championship. And those also have been um, rectified. And so uh, both the men's and women's officials will have the same game fees. Thanks, Lynn. Um, I believe we have an example of a progress in Division Two, just as we, yeah. we noted one for Division Three. Yeah, Thank real you. quick for Division Two um, is to explicitly call out when you look at our basketball specific national our national coordinator program. Um, division Two women's basketball was the only division of which we did not have a national coordinator. Again. Um, that was announced this past year that we that an that we had someone appointed to that position. But I do want to point out that we had been working with our Division II leadership um, over the last couple of years, so well prior to these reviews taking place, to make sure we had the Division II budget support and otherwise. Um, so it's important to note in the context of gender equity, but it's work that we had already been um, working to execute to put in place for this basketball season otherwise. Thanks, Lynn. Uh, Joni, you've already noted some of the internal efforts from you and your team last March and April, but I invite you to, to talk even, you know, give a few more examples of just organizational structure and, and things you're thinking about with you and your team. Sure, thank you. Um, so as uh, Amy said earlier, I mentioned the fact that we uh, took the opportunity to reorganize our uh, operations staff just a bit. And so we've designated uh, a sport leader for each of the 23 sports, um, as I indicated earlier. And the expectation with that person is, uh, again, a level of expertise uh, is raised a bit in the sport. 
that we encourage collaboration and communication uh, among the staff. Again, best practices overall, making sure, obviously, that we don't miss as it relates to comparing um, men's and women's, uh, you know, whatever it would be, you know, tennis, um, those championships. Um, and then um, finally, that um, then there's uh, also that same collaboration and encouragement to get on a schedule so that those, those committees are doing the same thing, uh, as I mentioned before. So we have making sure that D3 women's tennis and D3 men's tennis sport committees are, are meeting and that we're um, noting and sharing um, anything that's going on with, with those championships and being sure that we're equitable with, with, with what we're doing. Um, I, I just, with respect to the championships operation staff on, on, uh, with the 84, um, while we've not added staff, um, I do want um, to just note that Mark in his reports yesterday to the Board of Governor indicated that overall the national office staff is down a little over 10%. And so what we in fact feel good about, and I'm, I'm happy that um, we have been able to maintain um, our numbers. We didn't have to take that 10% cut. And so we feel like at least right now we're, we're good. We can continue to, to move forward with the championships, et cetera. Um, and we've not had to take, uh, again, that cut that our um, brethren and sisters have in the rest of the national office. And so we, um, we're, we're, we're happy about, about that for sure. Um, specifically, one of the positions that we are uh, hiring back, if you will, is a managing director position. And that role will assume a number of things, but one um, area will be um, ongoing and continual uh, reporting and review of all of our gender equity related monitoring um, statistics, uh, data, et cetera, and making sure that we know where things are and as importantly or more importantly, that anything that the membership, um, again, coaches, et cetera, that our committees need and want to know about those comparisons that we're on top of that, that we have the information and that we're ready pr to provide that um, at any time, so. Thanks, Joni, very helpful. Um, before I move on to talk about some equity um, initiatives that are even broader than championships, to talk about kind of an overall way forward, Lynn, Dan, Joni, anything else that you'd like to share in terms of um, the efforts in your areas? Yeah, yeah um, one quick thought I just wanted to share, because uh, this often comes up in a lot of our conversations, and, and as we're up here talking about, you know, side-by-side -side comparisons and all of that, to me, there's an overlay that also has to occur with all of that. And Joni's referenced it with some of the sports like sand volleyball, for, or excuse me, beach volleyball. That's what it was back in the day when mm -hmm. I worked with CWA, sorry. Um, beach volleyball, the women's basketball championship, um, soccer's others we can note. Where some of these championships are, we also have to give ongoing consideration of where they are in their growth phase. So it is appropriate, we have to do these comparisons, but there's other factors that we have to consciously consider as we work with our coaches associations and other stakeholders in this um, to continue to position our championships to be successful. So there, as Amy has provided, I think really great guidance on this point is that there may be non-discriminatory reasons why something may be slightly different for a similar uh, a sport of which there's two genders and it may be in a, a, the type of a marketing plan. It may be because you're trying to attract a different, different demographic of fan or whatever, but the non-discriminatory scrutiny and where Amy and the Office of Inclusion will continue to help us is through that examination. That's part of the check of the system. But I personally always feel that it's important to acknowledge that because of the growth trajectory for women's basketball in the, in, in the case that I get, I'm highly engaged of where we are at comparatively. This is the 40th anniversary of women's championships in the NCAA. So, and the 50th anniversary of Title IX. There's, there's just this consciousness by which uh, that we have to also approach this um, to um, respect and honor that, but in a manner that doesn't compromise gender equity overall. Thank you, Lynn. I and mean, we're, you know, just generally excited about the future and, and the changes that are, you know, are underway and will continue. And I, I recognized earlier committees. And I just want to recognize again the, it's the committees that, you know, that are the decision makers and the ones that have um, made some transformative change that will that will continue to to make that happen. 
the, the three of us up here uh, serve as spokespeople and facilitators and supporters. We don't make decisions, as, as you all know, in the membership. And um, Dr. Edmund doesn't make decisions. It's, it, these are committee decisions for the benefit of the student athletes and the championships. And, um, and it's, you know, we're, it's our privilege and pleasure to serve mm -hmm. them and, 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 and support the enhancements that are, that are being made. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Uh, yeah, just a, a couple of other things that I want to make sure that I note, and, and obviously my comments uh, this morning have been greatly focused toward Division I, but we take all three divisions very seriously. We will be engaging um, at a greater extent with all three divisions to be sure that those championships are meeting everyone's expectations and, and that they are equitable. So I want to make sure that, that I, I don't um, leave a message that is misguided in thinking that we're only focusing on Division One because that is that is not true. I will say that our staff and our sport committees, uh, because they are working really across all three um, seasons, it's probably going to feel as we provide reports to you about what's going on with um, these other 84 championships, it may feel a bit episodic, if you will, because we're going to have to have some start and stop time. Um, we really, um, for example, uh, we, we want to begin to look at um, what championships would make sense in terms of combining them. And that is not realistic for our sport committees uh, and really our staff to, to think about that undertaking until July when we're done executing the championships. And so it will feel differently to you. Um, the communication will be at a different cadence, but it is not because we, um, we, we are not taking it very seriously. Um, the, the other thing that I wanted to mention is, um, I, I noted it just very briefly earlier about um, and, and really, Lynn, I, I thought she was uh, heading this direction with her comment and almost was there, but, you know, we're, we're working on the criteria for uh, all of the decision-making around allocation of the resources for the championships. I think one of the, the pieces that will be um, a bit of a challenge, we've, we've got to pay attention, and it's also, um, again, Lynn, you make a great point, um, making sure that we're, we're encouraging and supporting the championships and the sports where they are, the other element for us that's really important is that, and I, and I think in some ways it's going to free us up for all of them, and it's a good thing, we, we have to consider and not lose track of those, um, those sports and those championships that are single gender. Mm -hmm. And so we have six of those. They're incredibly important. Beach, um, there, there, there are two men's and four women's, and I'm not going to test my memory <laughs> right this second, but we're aware of that. We have to not lose track of that, and we've got to be sure that the criteria and the way that we evaluate um, as somebody said to me the other day, don't worry about comparing the, the four women with the two men. Meet them where they are and continue to advance them and let's provide to them what they need on, on their terms. And so we, we are going to do that. Um, we'll be, again, going to all three divisions to get help um, on that piece, but, um, but we're, we're going to get underway and we're going to be sure that we're inclusive um, and meeting all of them um, where they are. So thanks, Amy. Thanks so much, Joni. And um, Lynn, Dan, Joni, thank you for sharing this detail. Um, you can tell your dedication, your leadership um, to providing meaningful and extensive change that supports gender equity across our championships. We know we want to get it right on our most important platform for our student athletes, um, our championships, but we also are very aware that throughout this process, we need to take actions that will lead to long-term and sustainable change that puts us in a position to proactively consider and act on equity issues, not only across our championships, but also across decision-making and key functions of our association. With that being said, I wanna talk a little bit about some ongoing work and next steps um, related to a couple of recommendations that span both phase one and phase two. Um, the Kaplan report in, in, both, in both phase one and two called for the development of a gender equity impact statement and also called for, and Joni just referenced it, um, a real-time audit of gender equity as we are planning and executing championships. So I wanna say a huge thank you to, the, the team, uh, to the, my teammates who work in championships, those who Lynn and Dan and Joni lead, because they've been at the table providing all sorts of insights and detail. As we work on a gender equity checklist, um, we have a really good draft for men's and women's basketball, and now we're looking at how that will um, work across all championships. And it's not just teammates in basketball. Kathleen McNeely's team in, in administrative services has been 
instrumental in, in helping with that work and thinking through strategically how we create a document that can be used going forward. So I wanted to mention um, that gender equity checklist that, that will be a living document that we will continue to improve. We are having our diversity, equity, and inclusion membership committees review the third version of this at their upcoming meetings at the end of January and in February. And we're also engaging extensively with the men's and women's basketball committees, as we will with the committees that Joni leads moving forward. And to Joni's credit and her team, we've already had conversations, um, even right during the holidays and after, on how that checklist transcends over to championships more broadly. Another example I'll share related to the gender equity impact statement that I referenced is that we have developed a gender equity evaluation process. And essentially what this is, is it offers NCA staff an opportunity to submit equity questions. So if they're working on some aspect of a championship or other key function at the NCAA, and they're thinking, you know, I, I think there might be something off here, I'm not sure if this is an equity issue, it provides a mechanism for them to, to, and to submit that question. And then our DE&I committees have also said, it isn't enough for just our NCA staff to have that, we certainly want our NSA staff who facilitate all NSA committees to allow committees the chance to submit questions like that as well. So we're working through the process of, of what that will look like, that we have an equity expert that will evaluate that, and we're setting up some long-term structures and processes that will lead us to what I've referenced as long-term sustainable change. Again, it's not enough to get it right in 22-23. We're committed to this on a, a much longer haul. So I'll also note that our National Office Gender Equity Steering Committee continues its work. We're continuing to move forward um, recommendations as the membership considers those from phase one. And as Joni outlined, um, her staff will be engaged as they're running all of our championships and looking into the summer at more work on those recommendations. So we're excited to know that that, that work is going on. But I wanted to present a little bit of the bigger picture. It's so great to get in the weeds and to know of those immediate changes that will impact our student athletes but this is a greater issue, broader than just our championships. Um, I'll now switch gears and turn to Title IX's 50th celebration. Um, we know the anniversary has been referenced a few times from the stage. Um, I'm very excited in this moment to unveil for the membership our Title IX 50th anniversary logo. Um, and so we had a national office advisory group working on Title IX at 50 planning with representatives from every department at the NCAA. We've been meeting since last February, and this really has been um, a team effort. The Office of Inclusion was excited to facilitate that group and the energy around that group. This logo that I'm showing you now will be available to the membership in different forms for you to use as schools and conferences um, are developing your own celebrations and ways to commemorate the anniversary. I'll share with you um, some plans um, moving forward, noting that probably most importantly is the the second bullet point there where it talks about a landing page, that is live as of yesterday. And so if you wanna know more information about Title IX at 50, get access to the logos. We have a web page where you can find all of that. Our kickoff of the celebration is the convention. So I, we could say that this panel and, and what we're doing moving forward is a way to launch us into this celebration. I invite you to visit our Title IX at 50 booth um, in exhibit hall B, uh, number 119. We have stickers and t-shirts there, so a little bit of Title IX trivia, um, so as you can test your knowledge. Um, we also will have, have available now on that landing page what we're calling a celebration toolkit. It's a short document, but it gives you some suggestions for how on your campus, your conference offices, et cetera, that you might commemorate and celebrate um, this important anniversary. I will note that the celebration of Title IX at 50 will take place across our championships in 2022, winter, spring, and fall. And I wanna emphasize that this is not only our championships for our women's program, it is all of our championships. Title IX is an important law about access to education um, that is, is had ma amazing impacts on our society overall. And indeed, some of the best champions of this law have been um, dads of daughters. And so we wanna to continue to think about um, this important law and to celebrate it um, across both our men's and women's championships. The Office of Inclusion and NSA Research are partnering on a report on Title IX's 50th anniversary. It'll be similar to one I wrote on the 40th and the 45th, and we're gonna lay it out there. Where are we 50 years after Title IX? What do the participation numbers look like by gender, race, ethnicity? 
What do the leadership numbers and athletics for administrators, coaches, et cetera, look like across gender and race and ethnicity? And what do allocation of resources look like 50 years after Title IX? That report is being worked on now and will be released this spring. It will be on our landing page and we'll also be sending it to the membership. I'll also note that our uh, 2022 inclusion forum, our annual inclusion forum will take place on June 15th and 16th. June 15th will be an evening kickoff um, and a celebration of Title IX for the inclusion forum with a full day of programming on June 16th. More information to come. I've already noted the actual date in my opening remarks, June 23rd, 2022. And I'm smiling down at Lynn because I know, and everybody at the table here, we're very excited about culminating the NCAA the celebration and commemoration of um, Title IX's 50th when divisions one, two, and three all gather in Dallas in April of 2023 for the final four, all three divisions in one place. So we'll look at that as our uh, culminating event for celebrating Title IX at 50. I will also note that we'll send an email out to the membership next week with access to the landing page, the Title IX toolkit, et cetera, to make sure that, that that's easily um, accessible to you. And I've talked a lot about this being a celebration, a commemoration. It certainly is that. But I think we all know, based on the conversation and the dialogue we've had today, it also calls for a renewed commitment to gender equity and finding ways to move forward for progress. It's been 50 years. It's time to do this and to get it right. I will then point out again, I told you I'd show this because we, we welcome you to um, we welcome you to ask questions. And so you can scan the, the QR code there or follow the directions there. My teammate in the Office of Inclusion, Abigail Edwards, is feeding me the questions on my phone and I see a few already coming in. But I welcome you to pose those. Um, we have um, a little over 10 minutes so we can do some of those. So I'll leave this up on the screen so that you have access to it. Um, as I'm looking at questions coming in, um, one, I think, Dan and Lynn, this one will be for you. And it's, um, it, it's actually an issue that I know because I attended meetings this week that's being discussed by our membership committees. Back to your point, Dan, about being membership-led. Uh, referencing the recommendation from the Kaplan report that there be consideration of a joint Final Four, um, we've got an audience member asking either here or virtually um, what's happening around that in terms of our committee engagement or any decisions in that area. Thanks, Amy. I'll start and then Lynn can, Lynn can add the, this deci decision around the idea of a combined Final Four in the future um, rests with the Division I men's and women's basketball committees. They've been engaged in this consideration um, since the fall, made a decision early on um, not to consider that uh, opportunity uh, before the 27 through 31 time period for the simple reason in their minds that we committed already to final four sites uh, through 26 for both the men's and women's championships and wanted to honor those commitments. So their consideration is in the years of 27 through 31. We have launched uh, the bid process for those final fours. The men uh, process launched in December, the women's uh, in uh, this month of January. They've been coordinated in such a way that those future Final Fours can be awarded either in a combined way or individually, and the committees uh, will be the final decision makers. We are coming uh, close to, to needing to make that final decision as to whether or not to uh, award a future Final Four as a combined event for men's and women's uh, championships, uh, but the decision has not been made yet. Lynn, I think that. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got another one here. It's asking um, about the gender equity checklist I just referenced and when will that be revealed and available. Um, as I noted, we're in our third version of that that addresses um, specifically uh, Division I men's and women's basketball. Our membership committees are, are looking at that in end of this month and in February. So I would guess later this spring, about the time that we're really getting into March Madness, um, that we would have that checklist in a form where we're ready to have it out there. We continue to make edits to it with valuable feedback from staff and from the membership. We certainly um, want our uh, membership-led committees to have another look at that as well, uh, both DE and I and those working um, directly with basketball. So thanks for that question. All right. Um, let's see. This is asking about how is the NCAA communicating progress 
um, of gender equity around championships directly with student athletes. So Lynn, I know you mentioned a student athlete group across women's basketball, but I invite anybody on the committee to talk about any ways that you're engaging through SAC or other groups with the progress that's occurring. Thank you. Yeah, a couple of examples. First of all, I did reference for um, Division I women's basketball. Uh, we activated with at the direction of the Oversight Committee a couple of years ago what we call a women's basketball student athlete engagement group. And that's where the 32 conferences are, are asked to appoint a women's basketball student athlete. Point being is that even that group has been active now for about two years. And frankly, conversations with that group started even back in March as some things um, started unfolding in San Antonio because that group, we felt it was important um, that they had direct communication from myself and Nina King, the chair of the Women's Basketball Committee, to allow them to ask questions and to be informed. And we've continued to engage with that group, um, whether it's Nina, uh, Lisa Campos, the chair of the Oversight Committee, or myself. And um, that took place all the way through the summer and even last, last month. So that'll continue. Um, as we look forward toward the championship, um, a, a student, student athlete wise, uh, we have some initiatives that we're about to um, embark on as a way to try to get to some other student, women's basketball student athletes specifically, um, particularly those that um, those teams have a very high probability of being in the championship. And that may be, so, and also to be a little more personal because we feel it's important again to provide that platform for informing, informing what's happening, what's, what may not be happening and why, and then also to allow to ask questions. So we're very much, and also the Division One SAC and everything. So there's a high degree of awareness. I would add in the, the category also though of significant direct communication, education and discussion place um, is our coaches. We've been very active with the WBCA. There's at the end of um, next week, there's actually a Division One town hall session that's about these kinds of updates as well as some other updates And the purpose was to talk about the championship but there's also direct communication with um, key coaches that continues to occur as well. So we're trying to take a multifaceted approach with that. Um, there's no perfect prescription for doing that, but fully understand the significance and the, and the importance of making sure that we are communicating with, as I said, what is happening and in the cases of what still may be different, why? Thanks, Lynn. We have a question about um, going beyond gender equity and championships and to have a committee or working group on an annual basis looking proactively at inequities across gender, across divisions, and in comparison to other things that campuses are doing. Um, so I, I, would, I would add that I mentioned it briefly when I talked about how important the membership was in this process. We do have four membership diversity, equity, inclusion committees. Lots of names here. Committee to promote cultural diversity and equity. Committee on Women's Athletics, the Minority Opportunities and Interest Committee, and the Gender Equity Task Force. I would say that those groups are very engaged, very involved in, in all of this, and will be at the table, not only looking at this across championships, but more broadly as well. So I think, and I also would say, as we have an important vote about the Constitution and we think about um, the NSA moving forward, certainly in the draft Constitution, DE&I is very prominent. And so I think it remains to be seen what this looks like, like moving forward, but we certainly want to keep that as a, a high priority. Um, had a question about, um, Dan, on the, on the men's side, men's basketball coaches and student athletes being communicated about changes, and I think that would speak to the improved communication and the collaborative meetings that are taking place, but I'll let you comment on that if you'd like to. Yeah. Sure. I, you know, I, I think um, Lynn noted that, you know, the communication effort um, is, is more targeted, frankly, with the women's community and the women's student athletes right now because of the fact that there's been so many changes and enhancements to the women's basketball championship we want to make sure that they're noted and and understood before that they, that experience happens here in in March and April of 22 um, but with the collaboration of the of, of the uh, championship committees and staff um, communication and sharing of information uh, with the men's championship participants um, and administrators is happening as well 
Thank you. We've had numerous, uh, some questions about uh, transgender student athletes and inclusion. Um, some of you may be aware the Board of Governors made a decision to that policy yesterday. Um, I, I send you to the Media Center for NCA, at NCA.org to see that change if you're not aware. Also, I know that there will be a communication with the membership today. So I'll just say that there's more information coming in that area. Um, I'll note that the NCA Office of Inclusion is committed to supporting all of our student athletes, cisgender, transgender, non-binary, um, as we move forward with decisions that are being made around policy. All right, we're, we're getting down to the last couple of minutes here, and we have a short break between sessions today. Um, the next one is on mental health, very, very uh, important topic, so I invite you to, to, to stick or take a break, but then come back for this. And I, I want to thank you for your engagement, for being here, for your good questions, both in person and those of you who are with us virtually. Uh, Joni, Lynn, and Dan, really appreciate you being with us and sharing in a very transparent and detailed way um, progress that is being made towards gender equity. We know there's a lot of work in progress. We know there's a lot left to do. Um, and, it, and it takes a team effort here. It is the national office, absolutely. It is the membership. It is all of us coming together. So I encourage all of you to stay engaged and to commit to working on equity um, in your places of influence and power um, so that as we get into this 50-year um, celebration of Title IX, we are on our way to more meaningful and sustainable long-term change. We ask that you would take the time to fill out the survey. The directions are there on the screen. Um, it's quick, it's only three questions. We also invite you to join in the conversation on social media at hashtag NCAACONV, and also you can follow what's happening throughout the convention um, at NC, inside the NCAA. Again, thank you for attending today. Um, wish all of you um, good health and um, a, a continued, hopefully, good start to your 2022. Thanks very much.